Welcome everyone to this award ceremony at this, the second virtual UACs conference. I'm sorry not to be able to see you all in person. Um, and I really look forward to seeing Simon Usherwood present the awards live at next year's conference in Lille. I hope you are all enjoying the conference so far. As you'll have seen, we have some excellent plenaries and a wide range of panels across the discipline of European studies. One of the nice things about being chair is being able to celebrate the academic successes of our community. And the awards traditionally given after the conference dinner are very much the pinnacle of this process. Last year, we didn't include the awards as part of the virtual conference. So this year, I'm delighted to be able to present both last year's award and this year's award for both the best book prize and the best PhD doctoral thesis prize as well, of course, as this year's Lifetime Achievement Award. So without further ado, let's get down to business. Let's begin with last year's and this year's Best PhD Prize. A reminder that UACs awards a prize annually for the PhD thesis that has made an original and promising contribution to research in the area of contemporary European studies. And it has to be a thesis that was examined in the previous year. And I'm delighted to announce that last year's winner of the best PhD prize for 2020 is Dr. Niels Gale for his thesis entitled Trade Policy with the Lights On, the Origins, Dynamics and Consequences of the Politicization of TTIP, otherwise known as TTIP. The judges described the thesis as beautifully set up, nuanced, clear, in-depth, methodologically sound, beautifully written, a veritable tour de force and empirically sophisticated. So many, many congratulations to Niels on this award of the best PhD prize for 2020. Thank you very much, Nick, for introducing me. Uh, it is, of course, a real pleasure and a great honor to receive this uh, OASIS best PhD prize. Uh, it certainly means a lot receiving this prize from the OASIS community and jury because I've, I've been to several OASIS conferences and events in the past years, I've met many people participating in it, especially realized that the quality of work and research is that flow through these networks is very high. And that of, makes, that of course makes receiving this prize in particular for me personally then uh, an even bigger honor. Uh, there's always an element of luck involved in these contests, obviously, as I'm sure that many others would deserve this prize as well, but it, it nevertheless means a lot to me receiving it from, from the OASIS organization. Um, and in addition, of course, receiving such positive and nice feedback on one's work is not taken for granted as well. Uh, in academia in general, I think we have to find additional ways of stimulating researchers, of making them and their work feel valued, recognized um, in a business where this is not a very common characteristic. Uh, so when, when one does receive such positive feedback uh, in this case or in any other type of situation, that is a huge motivation to keep going and one that I'm deeply grateful for as well. Um, and finally, academic work is also never solo work. So I want to thank uh, Ferdi de Ville, um, first of all, my then supervisor in the first place, uh, for his shared commitment to my work and development, uh, my colleagues and friends, Yelter Bollen and Thomas Jacobs, um, and by extension, the whole Center for EU Studies at Ghent University, who have made the whole PhD trip uh, an incredibly enjoying one. Uh, and of course, the great people from my doctoral guidance committee, uh, Peter de Wilde, Gabriel Sides Brugge, Gerry Alons, Jan Orbi, and, uh, and Fabien Vosser. So I'll stop here by saying thank you again to UASIS for this award. And I genuinely look forward to many more years of connecting with other researchers through this network. Thank you very much. This year's best PhD prize, I'm very pleased to announce, has been awarded to Charlotte Godzieski for her outstanding thesis entitled Health in All Policies at EU Level, a Critical Analysis. The reviewers described it as ambitious and clear in its theoretical objectives. They stated that it was very well embedded in literature about health in the EU and studies examining health policy. The jury would encourage the author to develop the thesis into a book which will contribute to a growing literature in the field and develop our understanding of the normative architecture that drives EU health policy. So many congratulations to Charlotte for the award of the best PhD prize for 2021. Hi. I'm Charlotte Kodziewski. I am 
absolutely delighted and incredibly honoured to receive this year's UAC's Best PhD Thesis Prize. First and foremost, I would like to thank UACs for all their support throughout my PhD and since. Being part of this friendly and dynamic family has really helped me develop as an early career scholar and I'm truly grateful for all the many opportunities they offer, especially to young researchers. I remember, for example, attending an early career workshop on publishing which really helped me with my very first article. And now I am extremely thrilled to be coordinating a research network on EU health governance with my fabulous colleagues, uh, Ellie Brooks and Mary Guy. And these are just two examples of the fantastic opportunities that UACs makes possible. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm very, very excited to be a part of it. I'm also really happy that health is becoming more and more visible in EU studies. Um, the pandemic, of course, uh, has made this topic very timely, but health in a broad sense is, of course, relevant to EU studies even beyond COVID. So it's nice to see this research angle flourish. And uh, last but not least, I want to thank my amazing supervisors uh, for all their support and guidance. Owen Parker and Simon Rushton from the University of Sheffield. And a massive thank you also to both my thesis examiners, Ian Beish, also at the University of Sheffield, and Kat Smith at the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. Uh, I wish everyone a great confer conference and I look forward to seeing everybody soon. Thank you very much. I'm now pleased to announce the JCMS Best Article Prize uh, for an article written in 2020, JCMS obviously being UAC's flagship journal. I'm very pleased to announce that Monica Bauer and Nicholas Sharon have won this prize for their 2020 article entitled In God We Trust, Identity, Institutions and International Solidarity in Europe. The judges said of this article, this is an excellent article. It deals with a very important and central issue of solidarity in Europe. The approach is very original. It is well theorized and carefully researched. Its findings make a significant contribution to the academic and policy debates. So big congratulations to Monica and Nicholas for winning this award of the JCMS Best Article Prize. We are honored and grateful to receive the Journal of Common Market Studies Best Article Prize. Uh, this was a wonderful surprise to us. Uh, thanks to the judges for their kind words in, in their motivation. Uh, thanks also to the Journal of Common Market Studies editors, uh, Richard Whitman, Tony Hastrup, and co-editors, and not least, um, its excellent community uh, of reviewers. Our article benefited a lot from, from, from their input. Um, also, thanks to the University Association for Contemporary European Studies uh, for being a vibrant and interesting community of scholars, and, and also, of course, to our colleagues and friends at the Quality of Government Institute and the Center for European Studies at Harvard. Um, so uh, th this article that, 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 that we just heard about uh, is funded uh, by uh, an EU Horizon 2020 project uh, called Perceive. And, and it seeks to address uh, why some European citizens support sharing economic resources across national borders within the EU, uh, while others uh, do not. So why would citizens want to share their tax money with people they don't know? Um, um, and typically economic interest and more rational explanation does surprisingly little to explain uh, support for international redistribution or foreign aid more generally. And, and, and many softer factors such as identity tend to explain that. So, so, so studies typically find that the more citizens identify with the Euro Europe or the European Union, uh, the, the more uh, they support integration and, and also sharing resources across borders. So we seek to uh, do a couple of different things in this article. Most importantly, we distinguish between different ways or different ways in which citizens can identify with the EU. So either uh, based on civic values, uh, rules, laws, or more uh, religious values, and particularly Christianity. And, 
And what we find is that citizens that identify with Europe based on civic ties are much more likely uh, to support international redistribution than those that identify with the EU based on, on, on religion and in particular Christianity. So if citizens believe that, that religion is, is the glue that binds Europe together, uh, they are less likely to support government-led, EU-led uh, international redistribution. So shifts in these identities also will have implications for, for international inequality uh, and, and European in integration more broadly. We also collected uh, our own data. Uh, uh, this data is free for everyone to use. So please use it. If you cannot find it, uh, send us an email. Uh, and, and thanks uh, so much again uh, for, for um, uh, giving us this prize uh, and, and for all your kind words. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm handing over to Nicholas. Yeah, I'd like to echo Monica's thanks, uh, both to the UC, UACES uh, conference and the judges uh, that selected our paper. This was, as Monica said, a, a really great surprise. We didn't even know we were nominated, and so it was a big honor to be selected for this. Uh, thanks to the JCMS editors and reviewers for all the help with the paper. Uh, I think Monica has said uh, thanks to all the people that we would like to thank. Um, uh, and I would just also like to say that uh, despite what, what many people might think or say, Monica Bauer is actually a great person to work with. I would like to thank her as well uh, for her great collaboration. We've, uh, we've, we've written a number of papers from this uh, project, Perceived Project, and uh, this is one of them. And I would like to just uh, say that without, uh, without collaboration with Monica, as well as the Perceived Project, Fun funded by the Horizon 2020, this project would not have been possible. So thanks to, thanks to everybody for this. The next awards I'd like to share with you are for the best book awards for this year and last year. A reminder that the best book prize is awarded annually for the book that has made the most substantial and original contribution to knowledge in the area of contemporary European studies in the previous year. Last year for 2020, for books published in 2019, we decided to award the prize to two books because the judges couldn't separate them uh, after they'd read them through. These were Dr. Eleni Franciu for her Oxford University Press published book, The Horizontal Effect of Fundamental Rights in the European Union, a Constitutional Analysis, and Professors William Patterson and Simon Bulmer for their Macmillan published book, Germany and the European Union, Europe's Reluctant Hegemon. Eleni uh, Franciau's book was described by one of the judges as the best EU law book I've read, a long needed book in the sphere of horizontal effect of fundamental rights in the EU. And it was described as very clearly explained and very clearly articulated. William Patterson and Simon Bulmer's book was described as an outstanding study of Germany in the context of European integration. And the judges described it, or one of the judges described it as a must read, where the argument is persuasive and presented in a compelling and accessible manner. Congratulations to Eleni and to William and to Simon. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank both William and Simon for everything that they've done for UACs throughout their careers. It's greatly appreciated. So here are a few words from our book prize winners for 2020, Eleni, William and Simon. Now, I know that by this point, it is very banal to start by saying that the last year and a half have been well difficult. Uh, but what I do want to say is that at any time, but especially during this time, it was incredibly uplifting and motivating to receive this prize. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful to UACs and the panel members for looking after my mental health and confidence. Um, and I think it's a subscription well worth its cost. Um, now, as the lawyers amongst you will know, um, the horizontal effect of fundamental rights has been a matter of intense discussion and critique in the European Union, if not since the Defren ruling, then at least since the court's judgment in Mangold. And that debate has only grown in the last decade with the entry into force of the Charter. Basically, horizontal effect has been the patron saint of EU law lecturers everywhere, uh, providing us with an unending source of exam inspiration over successive years. But more seriously, 
in this book, I try to present this debate in a broader perspective and to discuss what I think is an issue that goes beyond this rather technical uh, field of EU law. Whether and to which extent um, the rights that any society posits as fundamental should apply to private actors is a topic of profound contemporary debate amongst many, if not all, constitutional orders. And this discussion is only likely to grow further as private actors such as search engines, employers, service providers, or multinational companies acquire increasing and politicized forms of power that transcend the borders of any one state. I was very delighted um, to hear that the panel recognized uh, my contribution to the literature and was really humbled by the very kind comments um, and support I received when the prize was announced over social media. I wish I could have been there uh, to meet you and receive the prize in person, but I know that there will be further opportunities to do so and I, I look forward to that in the near future. Now, before I let you go back to more substantive work, I would just like to express a few words of thanks. Um, since, as you probably know, a book takes incredibly long to write, and between the time this project uh, started and the time I saw it in print, um, around seven years had passed. Now, that is apparently a lucky number, and it is true that I was very fortunate to have had significant support over that period, uh, both professionally and personally. So I would just like to thank Professor B.D. Kelt and Professor Virginia Manduvalu, uh, who saw me through the initial stages of this project as my PhD supervisor at UCL, um, but really have done so much more than that through the years. Um, and I'm, all, I'm, I'm just very grateful for their ongoing support. Um, I would also like to thank professors Ronan McRae and Paul Craig uh, for very kindly examining that doctoral project and encouraging me to work on developing it um, into a monograph. And Professor Paul Craig again, and Professor Grunet Verka, uh, who supported me through the publication process of the book in their capacity as editors of the Oxford Studies in European Law series. Um, I would also like to express uh, gratitude um, to Professor Sheila Benabi, Professor George Letzis, and Professor Colm O'Kennedy, who in various capacities provided formal mentorship or comments, um, and as, of course to many friends and colleagues who read drafts over this long period. Um, I feel indebted to four institutions too, um, UCL, Yale, uh, the University of Westminster, and Durham Law School at the University of Durham, um, where different layers of the project were put together. And of course, to the folks at Oxford University Press uh, for working their magic in, tr in transforming the manuscript um, into a book. Um, finally, I, I would just like to thank my family um, who have always supported my work and taken much greater pride in it than I ever have. Um, my parents and especially my father, Gerasimos, and my partner, Francois, uh, who put up with a lot of anxious outbursts uh, throughout these years. I won't take up any more of your time. Uh, thank you again for this very humbling recognition and many congratulations also to the co-women, to the co-winners, apologies, uh, Simon Bulmer and William Patterson for their book, uh, Germany and the European Union, uh, Europe's Reluctant Hegemon, which I very much enjoyed. Um, so th thank you again, and I wish you a wonderful and productive rest of the conference. I'd like to begin by thanking the jury and Emily for the way they handled the prize in exceptionally different circumstances. It's a source of great satisfaction that the prize is shared between two of UASA's longest serving members. We were referred to recently in a review article as the old masters. We didn't know quite how to take this. Uh, and Eleni Francio, Franciou, a brilliant young scholar. The prize represents the culmination of a 40 year partnership with Simon. We could not be more different in physical stature and personality, but the partnership has been a brilliant success. From my uh, perspective, I've always admired Simon's outstanding intellect and metho methodical approach. I'm inclined to rely to a much greater degree on intuition. In our period of study, Germany has changed from deliberately punching below its weight to sometimes acting as reluctant hegemon in following its trajectory, we have coined a succession of influential lenses. Domestic politics was followed by leadership avoidance reflex, semi-culver, gentle giant, milieu shaper to reluctant hegemon. In our research, we've been enormously aided by interaction with other scholarly, scholarly colleagues, notably Peter Katzenstein, Hans Maul, Wolfgang Wessels, Joe Jenning, Gunther Hellmann, jo Joachim Schild, Barbara Lippert, Tim Beichelt, Vladimir Handel, Charlie Jeffrey, and Douglas Weber. We'd also like to thank 
Steve Kennedy and Andrew Malvern for their support as editors and our publishers at different stages of what was a very long gestation. Finally, it's a source of great satisfaction to me that it is the UASIS Best Book Prize. I chaired for UASIS from uh, 1989 to 1984. At that time, I perceived that Europe was about to change utterly. And what I tried to do was to make UASIS future proof, notably by changing its financial basis from relying on commission grants, which UASIS and other bodies did, to income from the Journal of Common Market Studies. Here I'd like to thank Uwe Kitzinger, the founder of the journal, for his magnificent generosity. I had the great privilege of co-editing the Journal of Common Market Studies with Jim Rollo, Charlie Lees, and Daniel Wincott from 2003 to 2008. I should also like to thank you, Asus, for the award of a Lifetime Achievement in 2007. I was inspired to take on the UASIS chairmanship by the example of Helen Wallace, perhaps the dominating figure in the history of UASIS. Working with Eva Evans was one of the highlights of my professional life. An example of Eva's preternatural intelligence was her ability to add up columns of figures while carrying on a telephone conversation in one of three, foreign, one of three languages. The award of an MBE to Eva during my chairmanship gave me enormous satisfaction. I should like to conclude by thanking our wives, Phyllis and Helen, for their patience and waiting so long for the appearance of the book. Thank you very much. We were absolutely delighted to win the UAC's book prize and would like to thank the jury for their assessment, UAC's and Emily, and also congratulate Eleni Franciu, with whom we share the prize. We both worked since our PhDs on Germany and Europe, pursued in different decades in LSE's international relations uh, department. So the prize is the culmination of many years of work and both Germany and European integration, of course, changed dramatically since our respective research projects started uh, decades ago. So um, just to uh, perhaps say something about the book first of all. Um, we were drawn to this subject because during the 2010s, Germany seemed to take on a new role in the European Union provoked by the circumstances of the Eurozone crisis. And in the absence of the long standing motor of the EU, the Franco German relationship, or the EU institutions themselves really stepping up. Uh, it was left to German leadership, it seemed, to solve the crisis. Um, however, as the crisis evolved, Germany's austerity policies were, seemed in, were deemed in several of the debt estates to be a, a kind of hegemony. Uh, so that gave rise to this question, uh, which the book is about, is uh, Germany the European Union's hegemon? So using different understandings of hegemony, including resources, ideas, acceptance by partners, domestic willingness to play the role. In our conclusion um, of the book, we found only very limited evidence of hegemony. Institutionally, power in Germany remained deconcentrated, decentralized, even though perhaps the emergence of Merkel, Chancellor Merkel as Germany's, as Europe's leading politician was frequently, especially in the media seen as evidence of Germany's power. Uh, and Germany, of course, until the emergence of alternative for, for Germany had been seen as maintaining much more of a pro-European consensus. So all these things looked um, to support the idea that Germany perhaps could play this role. But our findings were that Germany was better described as reluctant hegemon, a, a term that Willy coined first in a JCMS article. Uh, but even the validity of this label depended on the, the policy area. We focused in particular on the Eurozone uh, and foreign policy. It was more applicable in the Eurozone than in the foreign policy. And then we had the migration crisis in the EU where Germany's uh, early efforts to play uh, a leading role uh, met resistance in Central Europe and, and at home. 
Of course, the book finished in the story in about 2018, 2019. Um, since it was published, there are new issues that have come onto the agenda. The Franco-German relationship has found new vigour with joint uh, initiative for EU reconstruction funding in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And what will happen after Merkel retires? Well, these, I think, are going to be uh, topics for others to look at, but the subject itself remains as important, we believe, uh, as ever. So now just to say some uh, uh, more personal comments. It's great to receive this prize and it seemed apposite to me at least because I retired last year and received word of this award shortly uh, afterwards. The first academic conference I ever attended in 1976 was on Germany in the European community organized by UACs with the Association for Study of German Politics. It was actually the same year 1976 that I first met Willie on a trip organized by the German Academic Exchange Council to observe the German elections. Three books, six articles and seven book chapters later, we're still actually working right now on, on a chapter. Um, so it's been a productive uh, relationship. Willie's professional wisdom was a major contribution to my academic year and his sharp uh, career and his sharp uh, political insights at such an early stage of my academic career turned me into a lifelong academic collaborator with several academics but the one with Willie was the original. Uh, collaboration with an author in my experience with Willie really works when you've got complementary expertise. Uh, so UACES has played a role in this research and it was great to be able to contribute to UACES as joint editor of the JCMS uh, with Drew Scott uh, in the 1990s, a particularly um, exciting period of EU research. Um, just to say some thanks to people who supported us over the years, and I'll say something about various organisations, Willie will say something about people, but our researchers at different times had funding from the Nuffield Foundation, the European Commission, the Bertelsmann Foundation, the ESRC, and intellectual support from UACES and the ASGP. Both of us have been firm believers in the need to conduct field work in Germany. We've had great support from different think tanks, the German, the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Auswärtige Politik, the Institute for Europäische Politik, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, the Free University of Berlin. There's been one kind of downside of this, I guess, and that has been absence when we're doing this field work from home. Um, so my wife Helen and Willie's wife Phyllis have had to put up with those absences, not only abroad, but also when we've been writing in our respective studies. So thanks above all to them for their support and forbearance. And it's a delight uh, in winning the award for this book to be able to add this prize to the UAC's Lifetime Achievement Award uh, of 2016. That brings me to the best book prize for this year, 2021, for books published in 2020. From an impressive long list, we whittled down the number of books to a short list of six, where a panel of four jurors poured over some excellent contributions to the field of European studies. In the end, we decided to award the prize to Dr. Vestert Borgel, for his outstanding Cambridge University Press published book, The Currency of Solidarity, Constitutional Transformation During the Euro Crisis. The book was described by one of the jurors as an exceptionally important book, meticulous in its analysis and with an appeal beyond academia. It was also described as clearly and engagingly written and an outstanding contribution to the field. It was a difficult decision for the jurors as the quality of all six books was very high. And we would also therefore like to give an honorable mention to two other books on the shortlist. Firstly, Dr. Caroline Gray for her excellent manuscript entitled Territorial Politics and the Party System in Spain. And secondly, to Peter Vorovsek for his thought provoking tome, Memory and the Future of Europe, 
rupture and integration in the wake of total war. Here are a few words from our winner, Dr. Wierstert Borger, and congratulations to him on being the winner of the best book prize for 2021. Dear conference participants, I feel very honored to receive the best book prize of the University Association for Contemporary European Studies. And I would like to thank the members of the jury for awarding it to me. I would also like to congratulate the authors, the other authors on the shortlist, which have also written fantastic books. Writing this book made me realize that the law is much more than a set of rules. It is also history. Whereas this is true for any legal system, it has special relevance for the European Union. In 1950, in his proposal for the creation of a coal and steel community, Robert Schumann predicted that Europe would not be made all at once or according to a single plan, but instead through concrete achievements. Over the following decades, he was proven right. The union evolves gradually and after under the pressure of events when it needs to adapt to a changed reality. At such moments, it is up to politics, to executive and legislative authorities to decide to act and reposition the union in the face of a new situation. And courts are called upon to scrutinize the actions. The constitution of the EU is consequently both shaped by and a reflection of such acts and judgments. History, in other words, is part and parcel of it. The European Union is currently fighting the coronavirus pandemic, but in my book, I examine another momentous event, the Euro crisis. When it erupted late 2009, it caught the Union and its member states off guard. The currency union was ill-prepared for taking on the market forces that were unleashed upon it. Its toolbox was poor and primitive. The law, central to European integration and one of its great achievements, could not show the way this time. The answer had to come from politics, and it came. At the height of the crisis, from 2010 to 2012, European politics saved the euro and with it the union through a constitutional makeover of its setup. One can distinguish between several kinds of constitutional change, for example, amendment and transformation. Whereas amendment takes place when a text of a constitution changes through a purposeful act of will, transformation allows the text to remain formally unchanged. In doing so, constitutional transformation operates at the intersection between law and politics legality and power. In my book, I argue that during the Euro crisis, the Union experienced a constitutional transformation, leading to a change in the meaning and substance of key provisions of the currency union's legal setup. Characteristic of this change is a widening in the currency union's conception of stability. Whereas it used to grant overriding importance to price stability, it now also explicitly takes into account financial stability. Financial assistance operations for distressed member states and government bond purchases by the central bank are the key manifestations of this change. To understand the change, I employ the notion of solidarity. I first use it to conceptualize the unity between the member states and then to analyze how political leaders in the European Council managed to preserve this unity during the crisis by committing themselves to safeguard financial stability. I then go on to show how this fundamental act of solidarity changed the legal setup of the euro by paving the way for assistance operations and government bond purchases by the central bank. And ultimately, I explain why the Court of Justice could not turn against this change when it had to rule on it in the cases Pringle and Gauweiler. And I argue that instead of assessing the transformation on the merits, it should have acted on this duty by declaring it a political question and displaying silence. Now, what would that mean for the position of the court? Would it lead to the demise of its authority, its subjection to the executive branch of government? No, the court may not be able to review how political leaders hold the union by safeguarding, safeguarding the unity between their member states during an existential crisis. It does control the question of when a case and which aspects of it qualifies as a political question. In that respect, it would still be the court that decides. Thank you for your attention. The Lifetime Achievement Award is presented to individuals who have made a substantial contribution to the development of European studies as, as a discipline. 
The award recognizes and values all kinds of contributions to the profession, including non-traditional achievements. I'm delighted to be able to present this award to someone that I've known for 20 years, both through my time working with her at the University of the West of England in Bristol uh, over a decade ago, and through her commitment and work with UACs. Um, she is someone who over the years has been a real mainstay of the UACs community. She helped to found the UACs Graduate Forum and served for a number of years on the UACs committee. One of the great things about our winner has been the way she has supported and nurtured early career researchers, always willing to give her time to help and to advise students and scholars of European studies. She was also an outstanding lecturer whose knowledge of and interest in Central and Eastern Europe was greatly appreciated, uh, I know from first-hand experience, by her undergraduate students. She started at the University of the West of England in 1974 uh, and retired in 2008, but she has kept uh, an active uh, research career going subsequently. And before I tell you a little bit about her research, I will uh, let you know who the winner is of the Outstanding Achievement Award for 2021. It is uh, Anne Kennard uh, of the University of the West of England. So Anne um, was researching the relationship between Central and Eastern European states in the European Union way before the 2004 Big Bang enlargement. And she was one of a very few, I think, UK scholars who was an expert in this field. Her research on Central and Eastern Europe was very much field-based driven, and she spent much time in the CEE states conducting qualitative research. She was uh, involved from the outset in the Balkans Peace Park project, which symbolizes peace and cooperation in the mountainous region spanning Albania, Montenegro and Kosovo. Anne's work has always been about borders and in essence, dare I say, the need to do away with borders. Her book, Old Cultures, New Institutions Around the New Eastern Border of the European Union remains an excellent tome and is well worth checking out if you've never come across it. Away from academia, Anne has always been a great ambassador for European studies and for European cooperation generally. She remains active in the Bristol Hanover Twinning Council for which she has been involved since 1996. So I'm delighted to present, albeit virtually, this award to Anne Kennard, an excellent scholar of European studies and lecturer of German and European studies and a passionate advocate of European cooperation. My congratulations to Anne, who is the winner of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for UACs. First of all, I, I was absolutely amazed to receive Nick's email. Um, I couldn't imagine that um, this would ever apply to me, but um, yeah, it was a really wonderful surprise, I must say. Um, and I've, I have to, the other thing I, I need to say is that I've always really enjoyed UACs as an organisation. It's always been very kind of democratic and inclusive. Um, and when I was on the committee, which I really enjoyed, obviously, um, I was delighted to be on the beginning of the graduate forum with Simon. I mean, that was really exciting to get that going. Um, as regards UWE, my, my former employer, um, the university in, in Bristol, um, my research there was kind of resurrecting research that I'd started in Poland. It, it took a different turn, um, but it, that all started well before the wall came down and, and it fitted then um, at that point for, perfectly into the new EU enlargement context and, and my European studies kind of environment, if you like, teaching and research. But <clears throat> um, I always really, really enjoyed teaching the students about, about Europe and especially about Eastern Europe because I was bringing Eastern Europe to them, most of them, unless they were Poles or whatever, they, they just didn't have any idea about Eastern Europe at all. Um, I can remember many years ago, 
um, mentioning the Baltic states and nobody had even heard of them, let alone could they name them. Um, so, you know, um, and um, I, I, in, in 2000, while I was still teaching and, and researching, I, I became chair of, of Bristol Hanover Council, um, the, 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 the city twinning partnership with Hanover. And that meant a different take on Europeanism. And, and it also led later to a kind of change of balance, if you like, when I finished teaching at UE. And alongside this, um, I was fortunate enough to become part of a wonderful uh, Peace Park project, um, the Balkans Peace Park project. Um, and that did an, a lot of really, really fantastic work. Uh, crossing very different difficult borders in a very remote part of Europe and, and uh, that was that was really very fulfilling I must say that was kind of alongside all the other stuff going on in northern Europe if you like. The Balkans Peace Park project was started by um, Antonia Young and her um, husband Nigel Young in the early 2000s. Um, they, uh, Nigel was one of the, fir the first I think uh, professor of Peace Studies in the United States. Um, they're both British and they live in Yorkshire. Um, and uh, I met them at, at University of Bristol, uh, a seminar that they gave and ultimately became involved with the, with the committee and took over from, as chair from Antonia. But it, it, it's all, the, the whole idea was um, that, that, that the, a peace park would be set up across the borders of Albania, Montenegro and Kosovo, obviously a very difficult part of Europe and but actually very simple in when you're on the ground. I mean, I've been many times, a number of times and and everybody thinks, oh, there must be guns around every corner. There aren't. Um, one of the main problems is the is uh, logging, illegal logging, actually. Um, but the idea is that that somehow we we could try and and remove the borders for practical purposes if you like because the borders go across the something uh, which is called the accursed mountains in any uh, any of the three languages it, it, it they are called the accursed mountains um and and we had we held summer programs um for the children in uh various villages um, mainly in albania but also kosovo we had meetings with um, United Nations environmental program um, about how to move the thing forward and there is now a long uh, a long um, what, what would I call it long distance that's the word I want <laughs> um, a long distance walk which has been organized by a German organization on the basis of the work that we did I might say um, a, a trail a, bulk, a long long distance trail through the mountains with places to stay etc which none of which was possible uh, originally. Um, so it was very, it was very exciting. The Peace Park project as such based here in the UK is fading now, but it's moved on to, to make things happen uh, in the, in the region. Uh, a very, a very fascinating region actually. So somehow I managed to finish the book, um, which included all of this uh, as another other stuff as well. And finally get the, the defill. <laughs> Um, and it was all really about crossing borders and I'm still crossing borders today, I would say, really. Um, so I've kind of morphed really from being an academic into being a practitioner um, as Bristol Hanover has become the, I would say, the, the main focus of my European identity. Um, it's a kind of practical way to maintain links with Europe, which are so important now, um, and it keeps me active. And it really is very, it's, it can be very exciting. In fact, next year will be the 75th anniversary of the, of the link between the two cities. And we're the only ones really who are celebrating in a big way. There's gonna be exchanges of all sorts of people, um, young and old mayors and all sorts of, you know, ordinary people and extraordinary people. So that's, that's really quite exciting to, that that's, still possible and still still going on and the Germans are really um, thrilled that we are post Brexit they that I know that they think that this is um, a most important way that we keep our links with Europe uh, between the citizens of Europe so um, thanks again to the UAC's committee for thinking of me and 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 recognizing all these various exciting things that I've been lucky enough to take part in 
and it has been a, a great honour and thank you very much. Well, that's about it for this awards ceremony. Thank you very much for watching through to the end if you got this far. I do hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks to everyone for their support over the last three years in my time as chair. It has been a real privilege to be chair of the association. And I wish my successor, Simon Usher, with all the very best in the role in the next three years. Thank you very much.